Well, I don't go anywhere and teach or preach across the street or around the world without texting this group called the seven of us. And uh, we added the seventh. I'll introduce her in a second. But um, the seven of us is my wife, Joanne, which you see behind me on the screen. And then we have two sons and two daughter-in-loves. So I text, I say, would you pray for me, but, but would you pray more importantly that God would speak to and through me and minister to people today? So my wife, Joanne, behind me here, and uh, we just celebrated 30 years of dating in June, and uh, that's fine, don't clap, but um, just kidding, <laughs> I'm just playing. And uh, we're actually dating now for 36 years, high school sweethearts, and um, yeah, it works like 1% of the time. Um, but we, we, it's not just Joanne and our boys and our daughter-in-loves. We've added a seven to the text string, but she doesn't know it, our granddaughter. This is Sophia. So my wife and our granddaughter, Sophia Manaya. And um, let's just take a moment. Just to... How many, come on, how many are in the grandparent club? Love it. I love it. It's funny because I don't want to get old, but I don't want to go back. So grateful. So grateful. Well, thanks for the opportunity today. I know that we are wrapping up from a dream to destiny, right? There's this journey you look at in Scripture of not just Joseph, but Joseph being the primary focus of how God orchestrates and begins to work. And, and, and like the conductor, he sets in motion some things in our life. Now, I'm glad you're seated because today, today I want to talk about something none of us like, delays. How many love a good delay, right? You, you, you pull out into traffic, and you're running a little behind, and so you're already going to speed a little bit, right? And um, you're like, God bless the angels guarding my car right now, right? And uh, like, strengthen them, Lord, right? Guard their, and then shield the policeman from my, right? All, whatever you're praying. And um, we don't like delays. In fact, I, what, I'm barely a Christian if traffic's really bad, and I'm all in with Jesus, okay? I just don't like traffic. Uh, maybe you're at the grocery store. You're about to check out. Come on, you got your cart, and you're looking which line is fastest. And it's not just the line. It's the checker, okay? Who is expedient? I try to get into the fastest line, but I've discovered over the years, I have, and I've made this up. It's called slow lines disease, okay? So whatever line I get into, oh, crawls. So avoid me at the grocery store. Delays, all shapes and sizes, seasons. And situations. And some are significant. A prognosis. You're waiting for a kid to return. Some are silly. Simple. Maybe, maybe say you're here today and you're single and ready to mingle. You're like, God, I'm ready. <laughs> what are you doing with him or what are you doing with her? Delays. We all get it. Here's the tension. Now, if you find yourself in a moment or a month or an extended season where what you hoped for and prayed for and expected to have happen doesn't, you're in what I would call a delayed destiny. And it's that period where you're expecting something, you're hoping, you're praying, you're even working towards, but then there's this journey that you go on. It's this pause. It's the pending. And the tension with that is in the midst of that, we can begin to wonder and ask questions. We can surmise in either like a, a, a peaceful moment of contemplation or a moment of panic that one of three things, by the way, these are all wrong. The first one we might think is God's out there somewhere far off, uninterested. Like he's looking over the balcony of heaven. He's like, Moses, come here. That's what, <laughs> look at her. We think he's distant, but the Bible says he's Emmanuel, God with us. He's not far off. He's close. In fact, if you're hurting or there's heartache, the Bible says he's close to the brokenhearted. Okay, but we might think he's far off and uninterested. The next one is this. If God knows everything, I must have forfeited his favor. If he knows every, like everything. And here's the thing. You were never that good to start. <laughs> you can laugh. It's okay. You were never that bad. It was never about you. It wasn't all of a sudden God's like, oh, wow, now I love you. This was never the mission of God. The message of the cross is that your goodness doesn't get you in, but your badness doesn't keep you out. It's the grace of God extended to us through Christ Jesus. So it was never because you were so good or so bad. It's because he's so good. It's not you didn't forfeit his favor. And the last one is this. 
well, maybe if anything's going to happen, I better make it happen myself. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. There's a problem. What if you don't own boots, right? I mean, like, if you, what if you get some momentum? What if you have some favor and you start to think, I made this happen? Instead of God being at the center, we put ourselves there. And there's not room at the center for anyone but God. So I'll say it this way. If you're surprised that you're not where you thought you'd be in life or love or your relationship with Jesus, you're not alone. What I want to propose over the next 25, 30 minutes is that the, the delay that you're navigating, though admittedly painful, it has the potential to produce something in you that's epic, a new you. And it's, it's most often how God works, inside out, heart first. So between 1981 and 2011, the space agency NASA conducted 135 shuttle launches on five different shuttles. And in order for the shuttle, which weighs 4.4 million pounds, to get from the storage facility to the launch pad, it had to be transported on something. So they had to literally invent and create this machine called the Crawler Transporter. Six million pound, at the time, the largest man-made object in the history of the world. And it, it transported the shuttle to the launch pad. And it went from its storage facility over a five-hour period at a blazing speed of one mile an hour. Here's what's so crazy. In order for the shuttle to get out of Earth's atmosphere, it had to go from zero to 18,000 miles an hour over eight and a half minutes. But it got to the storage, from the storage facility to the launch pad at one mile an hour. And we understand intuitively one trip made the other trip possible. Once out of Earth's atmosphere, the shuttle has the capacity to, to go 23.6 times the speed of sound. But it gets from its storage facility to the launch pad at one mile an hour. And I don't think our lives are much different. Before we get to see the stars, Sometimes we slowly make our way down the street. And God's in the midst of all of it. There's something incredible that we begin to discover as we lean into the delay. Often, in order to go fast, we first have to go slow. And it might seem like the opposite would be true, but listen to this, Discovery Church. A delay does not indicate disinterest on God's part. You have a delay... And you're expecting something different, so you're like, well, God, this, he doesn't care anymore. That's not true. God is close to the brokenhearted. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And he's int intimately and intricately connected to each chapter of your story. That delay, whatever it is, however long it is, doesn't mean that he's checked out. It actually might mean that he's leaning in. The story we're looking at as we bring a conclusion to the series is once more the story of Joseph. And this will be a reminder. Let me just give you like the, the snapshot of him real quick. He's from the land of Canaan, which is modern day Israel and, and outside of Jordan there. Uh, he's in the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like patriarch, key families in the Old Testament. In fact, he's in the lineage of Jesus. So this is a big deal. He's one of 12 brothers, and he is the favorite. So much so, you've heard about it, he got a, a coat of many colors that set him apart, and his brothers hated him, but he was mom and dad's favorite. Now, here's the thing. If you have multiple children, let me, let me just ask this. If you have multiple children, let me see your hands, okay? More than, more than one. On the count of three, I want you to shout out your favorite child's name. Okay? <laughs> I'm just playing, Okay. <laughs> But we are at church, and so the Lord knows you were starting a list, okay? <laughs> there was no question Joseph was the favorite, okay? But his brothers hated him, like capital H. And we pick it up after he has an interaction with them. He goes to see them one day, and they say, oh, here comes that dreamer, and they conspired to kill him. At the last moment, a brother intervenes, and instead of killing him, 
They decided to beat him and throw him to an empty cistern, a well that didn't have water in it. And then they had lunch. Like the Bible, everyone, the Bible's great. The Bible is real and raw. It's messy. And it's epic and it's beautiful because it, it's a story we can relate to. Well, they decided we're not going to kill him. We're going to beat him. And now they threw a rope down in the empty t- cistern. They pull him out. And I can imagine Joseph, as he's coming out of the cistern, he's like, oh, when I get home, I'm telling mom. He's 17. He's a little whiny. I'm telling mom and dad, you guys are so busted. But he doesn't go home. He's sold into slavery to an Ishmaelite caravan on its way to Egypt. And that's where we pick it up in chapter 39, verse 1. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guards, who was in charge of all the soldiers, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. And then we get to verse two. How many of you have ever highlighted a verse on your phone or in your paper Bible? Like you want it to jump off the page, so you turn, you're like, oh, I love that promise, okay? This is one of those verses, but it will seem in a moment like it shouldn't be there. Joseph sold into slavery, taken into a foreign land, And we read this, the Lord was with Joseph. (laughs) Oh, pause. What? Beaten by his brothers, chucked into a cistern, dragged out, sold into captivity, and the Lord is with Joseph? You ever ever read the Bible and go, really? But what we don't see is that God is orchestrating He's setting some stuff in motion. Pastor Jason has been teaching on this. He's setting some things in motion to prepare and and, and position Joseph for God's plan. The Lord was with Joseph, so he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success and favor in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes, and he became his attendant. This is miraculous. He goes into town as a slave at the bottom of the bottom, and now he is attendant to the leader of the home. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Verse 6. Now Joseph, like Pastor Jason, was well-built and handsome. What translation do you guys have? (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) I wrote that in. And after a while, this part doesn't apply, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and says, come to bed with me. Pause. Pause. You can't help but think, Joseph, at one point might have thought, this is my one chance at affection. This is my one chance for love. Maybe it'll advance me in the house. But here's the thing. He goes to the reservoir of his character in his response to her. But he refused. And then he begins to not not just remind her, but I think he's reminding himself of the promise and, and, and what God's plan is for his life. With me in charge... My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns has been entrusted to my care. He is puppet hand talking to himself. That's not who you are, Joseph. There's a better plan. God, y'all need to do that sometime in your car. And do the puppet hand. You're just driving down the road. People are like, ooh, put the blinker on and get into another lane. But you need to speak the promises and the truth, and we got to come back to what has God said about us? Who am I as a woman of God? Who am I as a man of God? Who are we as a family of God? I'm declaring this over my life. There's power in the tongue, the Bible says. He says, no one's greater in this house than I am, and my master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you're his wife. And notice his response, how could I do such a wicked thing And he doesn't say sin against you or me or my family or your family. How can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he sets up some out-of-bounds markers, some guardrails. Two things. He refuses to go to bed with her, and he refuses to even be with her. Now, there's some things. I know you've looked at Mrs. Potiphar uh, in the series, but there's some things we discover about Mrs. Potiphar, and one of them is she is persist. Tent. Okay? By the way, that's what sin is, too. Sin will, like, attempt one time. The enemy will try to come in, and you're like, man, I'm strong. That spirit of God. Two hours later, he'll come back. Just checking. What about now? Two weeks later, 
This is where that, the, 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 the character and the reservoir of our character has to be filled. You cannot make a withdrawal if you haven't made a deposit. Like, why do I keep sinning? Are you depositing the truth of God's word, the promises of God? And what happens is through the Holy Spirit, we begin to pass tests we used to fail. And Mrs. Potiphar sets in motion a plan. And here's her plan. One day they're in the palace. Joseph's there. She's there. She sends out all of the attendants, and she tries to seduce him. Now, let me go back to the story where Joseph's beaten and thrown to a pit. They tore off that fancy coat that mom and dad had given him that set him apart. They dipped it in animal's blood, and they brought it back to dad and said, a wild animal must have devoured your son. And he was inconsolable. Now, he's with Mrs. Potiphar, she grabs his robe. He spins out of it. Your pastor's talked about it. Second wardrobe malfunction. If I'm him, no more robes, okay? I don't know what I'm going to do. If it's going to be a satchel and I'm going to tie it. I don't know. A satchel's a bag. That would, don't just wear a satchel ever, okay? <laughs> Unless you're married, okay? But he's got to figure out there's a problem here. Spins out of his coat. She's left holding it. And she's like, a foreigner has come in to make sport of me. And he's falsely accused of trying to seduce her when she was trying to seduce him, and he's thrown in prison. And verse 2 seems like it shouldn't be in the Bible. Is the Lord still with Joseph? Is God's favor still on him? And this is where the depth of God's word comes to the surface. Can you operate in the favor of God and not the favor of man? And the answer is yes. And sometimes we equate God's favor with man's favor. I'm telling you, if you're picking one, choose God's. He's thrown into prison, and the scripture says, he's a teenager at this point. The scripture says he began to attend and build rapport with two other inmates. And the two inmates he connected with was a guy who used to be the cupbearer and another dude that used to be the baker to the king, Pharaoh. Pharaoh, king, same dude, different words. And he begins to attend to him. And while in prison, just like when he was 17 and had a dream, now they have a dream, and he notices them, and one day they're in prison, and he's like, hey, something's different about you. And as I read that, I was like, man, how do I respond when I'm in a holding pattern, when I'm in a delay? Is it all about me, or do I notice people still? How do you respond when you're in a tough time? And is it always just, well, make sure you, you get a chance to hear what I'm going through, or do you ask, tell me what you're going through? There's power in that presence and not having it always be about us. And this is what Joseph models. And here's what they said. We both had dreams. And now he's approaching 30. He's about 27, 28 at this point. And he says, I can't interpret your dream, but the God I serve can. At 17, he thought he knew everything. And here's their dreams, that, which he interprets. They're both going to get out of prison, and one of them is going to be killed. In fact, the baker was beheaded. Before they get out, Joseph says, hey, come here, come here, guys. Listen, simple two-word request. (laughs) Remember me. And then you know what happens? Nothing. In fact, here's the full verse, chapter 40, verse 14. But when all goes well with you, remember me, and show me kindness, and mention me to Pharaoh, and get me out of this prison. And now he's waiting at the, the, dar, the door, excuse me, or the bars. He's waiting at whatever the entry point is to the prison. And, and both guys are out, and, and now it's two hours. He's like, ah, that's kind of fast, okay? And now it's like two days, and he's like, probably paperwork. It's in the wrong stack, right? And I'll just hang out here and wait. And every time the footsteps of a soldier come down the corridor, he's thinking, this is my get out of jail moment. And you know what happens? Nothing. Two weeks and two months and a year what, what, do, what do you do when you're in the middle of a delay? How do you respond? Do you start to say, God, you don't care. If you cared, you would be there. I must have done something to, to mess it up. And what Joseph begins to discover, this, this revelation that begins to be formed in this development season, is that with God, nothing is ever wasted, even our waiting. But how many of us would ever choose that? How many are irritated at the microwave watching popcorn pop? Like, this is taking forever. 
It's two and a half full minutes. We don't like, we want fast. Somewhere along the way, we picked up, tried on, and began to wear this idea that everything we hoped and prayed and worked for was going to happen now. I want, I want you to hear this. I believe this to be true. What happens to you in your delay directly connects what happens through you afterward. And there's something God does in you and through you, in your delay, in your development, in the disappointment, in the frustration, in the process. We want the product. We don't want the process. We want the outcome. I don't want the obligation of actually doing something. But God's like, listen, the process actually is the product. Because in the midst of that delay, you begin to develop some dependence on me. Your hope and your confidence begins to rest on who I, I am and not who you are. Let me ask this question. What are the predictable um, persons, places, or things that have the potential to hinder your development? Come on, all of us have a, a group of friends that maybe we used to roll with, okay? Or you could connect with now. And, you know, when you're with them, you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> and this is like, the here is like that place of regret. Like, how did I get here? <laughs> I was just, like two weeks ago, I was doing so good. And then here's the other side of the, how did I get here? How did I get here? Oh, God is so good. I can't believe the friend. I can't believe the favor of my life. How did I get here? Here's the answer to both. You put yourself in a current that took you somewhere. A current is imperceptible to the human eye, but it takes you somewhere. Like a, a leaf in the wind, you can't see it, but there's an effect it has. So who are those in your delays, in your disappointment, in your temptation? Who are the people and the places that have the potential to distract, but also who can develop you? And just being here, you're putting yourself in a current that'll take you somewhere on purpose rather than on accident. And when it seemed like Joseph's destiny had been deleted, not like a comma, it had been deleted, we get to one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, Genesis 41. One, and here's what it says. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. Two full years. How many think two months is a long time? How many have been praying for like two and a half minutes at the altar? God, I just, I just call it. Where are you, God? What's happening? Why are you waiting? Two full years. But what you see as you dive into the story is that Many of life's most valuable lessons are mined from the most difficult moments. It's not the easy street that does the best for you most of the time. It's not when everything's always good. It's in the difficult times. It's in the heartache. It's in the, I had to keep going. I had to hold on. I had to not pull the ripcord when I wanted to quit that forms your character. So I mentioned we have two sons, our oldest son, Justice, our youngest son, Josiah, so I'm Norwegian. My wife is Samoan, Pacific Islander. And so our boys are just big, okay? It's like they always are wearing a bag helmet, even without a, a helmet on, okay? That's the, the benefit of being Norwegian and Samoan. So Josiah, though, 6'4 now, just is 6'3. I'm the little guy, 6'2. And, and when, uh, relative, right? And, and when El- Sai is in elementary school, He's in his room. I'm over in our room. And he, he says this. And you'll hear a little bit of his drama. He's like, Mom! Mom! He says it three times. Mom! Realizes mom's not only not responding, and she hasn't come in. So he pivots to his second round draft pick. Dad! Okay? Oh, no, me. And I'm like, I know. Mom's all of our favorite. And I go in, and I sit, sit at the foot of his bed. Remember, he's an elementary school kid. He's not a grown man. And he says, Dad, my legs are killing me. And I knew in that moment what he didn't know. He's having growth pains. I asked him a couple questions. I said, Josiah, do you want to be five feet tall? (laughs) Yeah. Chin quiver, right? Do you want to be six feet tall? (laughs) Yeah. Do you want to be seven feet? No. No. Okay, I get it. I said, if you want to grow, you have to have the pain. Now, I didn't say it in the moment. I wish I would have. I wish I would have said this. I said all that. I wish I would have said this. Your pain has a purpose. In Discovery Church, let me tell you something. Your pain has a purpose. 
You want to you want to you want to cap out at whatever spiritual height you're at? Fight pain. One of my mentors says this: Your growth is directly connected to the amount of pain you're willing to endure. Why? Because I don't want to grow, but that growth requires some growth pains. Here's maybe a not a simplistic, but a simple way of saying it: Slow motion is still motion. It's not as fast as you want. It's not happening as rapidly as you want. But slow motion is still motion. And most of our growth is not obvious. It's incremental. Something happens when our perspective shifts from irritation at the, de- the delay to now an anticipation of the development. Something, it's called maturity. It's called wisdom. It's called discernment, which is an overflow of God developing us in our delays. Pastor Jason talked about at that worship night Friday, that one degree difference is a difference between hot water and boiling water. Between a a plane taking off and landing and a plane just running out and crashing. One degree, these little course corrections along the way. And God uses these, these delays to develop some dependence in in us on him. And in that process, our perspective can begin to shift from, oh, I can't believe this is happening to, I wonder what God wants to do in me and through me because of this. There's a lens that we begin to look through that frees us up. Now, I want to give you a couple of promises that Jesus offers us. The apostle Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and he says this. He starts by saying, um, Philippians 1, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And then we get to the verse you're going to see. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. God's a promise maker and a promise keeper. What has he started in you that he's continuing to Develop. What about Jesus in his own words? I love what he says. He says, I've told you these things so that, and he's talking about following him, the challenges of living for God in a, in a world that doesn't. I've told you these things so that in me, he says, where is our peace found? In him, in me, you might find peace. And then he says this, in this world, you'll have trouble. <laughs> Some of us, we said yes to Jesus and we thought everything was just going to be easy street. Bloom bouquets and puppy dogs and everything's awesome. And then you say yes to Jesus and all of a sudden you're like, ah, my life's still a little broken. My soul's saved, but my family's jacked up. My, my job's messy. I have broken relationships. And what we begin to see is God's walking with you through it now. You're not on a solo flight anymore. In this world, you'll have trouble. But he says, take heart, for I've overcome the world. And you know what that includes? Everything all of us are navigating. Come on, across every campus, online, there's nothing you're navigating. God's not in you with it. He's not like, good luck, check back with me in a few months later. Come back later when things settle out. He's close to the brokenhearted. He leans in when you're confused. And then we get to this other promise, Galatians 6, 9. And here's what it says. Do not become weary in doing good. But the proper time. Like I wrote about this in, in, in the book. What is the proper time? What does eventually actually mean? Because eventually it can be really fast or it can be really slow and long. But eventually what we see is this. If we're not becoming weary in doing good, but in the proper season we'll reap a harvest. And here's this ginormous two-letter word, if. And this is our part. If. You do not give up. I think some days, the best thing you can do is just not quit. <laughs> I mean, you just like, I, come on, how, how many of you, I got a moment, how many of you have ever decided, I'm going to get fit this year? So you start going to the gym, it's January, and every machine has people on it. Some of them, people are like using the machine wrong, but like, this is the year, right? And the problem is, let's say you do legs, okay, and you lift with legs, That first day, you're like, that was hard, but it wasn't that bad. The next day, you're like, man, my legs are sore. Here's what's so powerful. It's not the next day. It's the day after that day where you're like, I can't even squat. And I mean, like, for basic necessities. (laughs) You say, you're like, it's going to be here all day, (laughs) right? 
And what happens is, if you don't push through the pain of that, you never get the progress on the other side. Sometimes the best thing is just to go, listen, there's going to be pain, but there's purpose for it. Because God's growing me, and he's growing our marriage, and he's growing our family, and he's growing my heart. I love stories of people who do exceptional and just even try doing difficult things. That, that's your pastors, honestly. They're visionary people. They're, they're continuing to grow. So let me say it this way. If you lack depth and determination, you'll quit something that's difficult at the first explainable opportunity. Come on, y'all, you'll sit down with a friend at coffee or over a meal, you're like, well, I was going to do it, but then this happened. They're like, oh, that makes sense. I want a friend that's like, what are you doing, you quitter? Freaking slacker. I, didn't, I don't want friends who are slacker. I, I want that kind of brother. I want someone saying, ah, uh, it's not who you are. If you lack depth and determination, by the way, both of those have to be developed. Depth doesn't happen immediately. Determination, you only get that by not quitting over and over. But if you don't have those, you quit something that's difficult at the first explainable opportunity. So Florence Chadwick, inspired by her, she's passed on now, but on July 4th, 1952, she is uh, attempting a world record swim for women. She'd already um, swum the Straits of Gibraltar. She'd already swum the English Channel in both directions. And every time I say the word swum, it doesn't sound like a word, okay? But it is a word. I checked it out. It means already swam, okay? So she had already swum these epic uh, swimming uh, endeavors, right? And now she she is at the shores of California, and she is attempting to swim the 26 miles from the mainland of California to Catalina Island. What? How many are runners? Let me, hear my, let me see my runners in the house. N- wow. I've asked this question all over the nation. Least running group in the history of church. And I want to tell you, I am with you. My favorite part of running is when I stop. <laughs> like this, I actually got the shoes one time, nice ones. I don't go part way, people. I got the Daniel Dukes. It's a Daisy Duke. It's the boy version of the da- da- Daisy Dukes, right? They're super short shorts. My wife's like, what are you doing? I'm training. I got the magazine, Runner Magazine. It's a great, I love the articles. And then I went running and I'm like, a block in. I'm like, I hate this. Running's stupid. So she's not running a marathon. She's swimming 26 miles. But she's already swum (laughs) epic distances before. So she trains and she starts out. Here's the two things for qualifications for her race to be ratified as a record. Two things. Number one, you can't have any outside buoyancy, no flotation device, no log, life jacket, any floaties, no water wings, right? And you can't have any contact with a guide boat. Now, she's 15 hours into her swim, and she started the swim with clear visibility, but partway through the swim, fog began to descend over Catalina Island, and it obscured her ability to see her destination. I'm quoting here, her, here's what she says, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. What she didn't realize after 15 hours in the water, again, this is 1952, was that she was less than half a mile from her destination. She had, over 15 hours, swum 25 and a half miles. But because she couldn't see her destination, she tapped out. And I might have come in this weekend to tell someone at the Northwest campus or online don't touch the boat. Maybe in this room today, in your marriage, you just need to hear someone remind you, don't touch the boat. Don't quit. Maybe in your faith, maybe even your life, maybe, maybe the enemy's whispered in your ear, no one would even know. No one would even care if you're gone. Yeah, we would. It's almost always too soon to quit. Don't touch the boat. 
You know, Joseph's life and his story, I know you've teached and taught through this, but how, how that comes to a conclusion is in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He has reconciled with his brothers after God using Joseph to miraculously provide for humanity at the time. Seven years of enormous crop abundance followed by seven years of famine. And that famine, his brothers who had rejected him, sold him, have now come to him bowing down and requesting grain. He reconciled with his brothers. He reunited with his father. And now his dad's about to die and his brothers are afraid. He's only showing kindness because dad's still around. And here's what he says. Listen to the lens and the perspective he's developed in his delays. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. See, Joseph's story is the front row seat to the providence of God. And that God doesn't waste anything, even our waiting. For Florence Chadwick, her story didn't end with touching the boat and negating all of her efforts. Because two months later, she attempted the same swim. And she beat the men's record by two hours. And it's this reminder that even if you touch the boat and, and, and pulled the plug another time, doesn't mean that you have opted out altogether. That there's still a destiny, even if it's obscured. Here's, here's what I wrote in my notes. Maybe your next best step or your next best prayer is not, God, why have you caused me to go through this? Or even, when will you get me out? But what do you want to develop in me through this? I know the most important decision you're ever going to make, it's true for all of humanity, is how we respond to the love of God extended to us through Jesus Christ. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.